Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We'll go ahead and get starting. We are live streaming right now on our MAP Facebook page, and we do have um, all of our other social media as well. So keep in touch with us on upcoming events um, in the future. And we try to have these webinars several times during the semester that cover several different topics from our MAP participants that they are really curious about. And, and this topic of navigating mentoring relationships within industry and other careers outside of academia has been one that has been requested several times by our students. And we're very fortunate to have a, a panel uh, of experts that are, that are able to talk about what they have done in their careers and, and how mentoring has helped them. And the description of this uh, event is uh, that we will feature this panel of business and industry professionals who share strategies and advice about developing and maintaining their mentoring relationships. And we're really focusing on managing these relationships in uh, all types of different spaces as well. So I'm Stephen McBride. Uh, I am a graduate student in uh, Purdue's Agricultural Sciences Education and Communication Department, um, nearly done with my PhD, and I'm also uh, an assistant director of graduate student success within Purdue's College of Engineering. So wearing two hats and very happy to be back with MAP today. And uh, I want to start with uh, introducing the rest of our panelists that are with us this morning. Um, I guess we're in the afternoon now. And uh, for, for our panelists, please just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your journeys uh, that you have experienced going from your academic careers into industry and, and what that has been like, uh, and just briefly uh, a little bit about yourself. So I'll just start with the, on, on my screen, who's first, and, and that's Diane. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, unmute yourself and, and please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Stephen. I am Diane Ripberger. I am a Purdue graduate. Uh, I won't mention the years, but School of Science for Molecular Cell Biology, and then found the right way into the School of Ag for the food science degree. I've, I'm currently, um, I've been working about 20 years with PepsiCo, and out of grad school, I've had numerous jobs across my career development across PepsiCo. Today, I am the Senior Director for Global Foods Innovation, and I lead the breakthrough innovation across um, multiple markets for PepsiCo on that side, um, US, UK, China, Europe, as we continue to go across. The key part, as I'm looking at mentoring ship and the excitement around it, is I feel like often we don't know how to unlock it. We don't know how to get the most out of it. And so I have an intense passion over my career of where mentoring has helped me and has gotten me to where I'm at today. And so I'm excited to share what I have found out along my journey. Awesome. And Andrea, you're next on my screen. So uh, please introduce yourself as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Andrea Hubbard, a graduate of Alcorn State University. Uh, my focus areas were business and agricultural economics. I am a senior operations analyst um, at Lando Lake. So I work with our dairy foods business. There are four businesses under the Lando Lakes umbrella, but my focus is our uh, butter and cheese business. And I am excited to share with you all today about my mentoring and mentee journey throughout my career. Very good. And uh, I, I believe uh, Patrice is with us now. So uh, if you could uh, introduce yourself as well, that would be amazing. What about now? I believe we can hear you, yeah. Okay, so my name is Patrice Bailey. I am the Assistant Commissioner here at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. I am a graduate of Prairie View A&M University and um, I am working on, well, we just released the license plate just now for the state of Minnesota. Um, and I'm just so happy to be here with this great panel and I don't know why the, um, the uh, video isn't working, but I'm, I'm right here. <laughs> That's quite all right. And I'll actually stick with you on this first question and yep. uh, we'll just kind of rotate around between our panelists and, 
uh, give as much insight as you can think of on some of these questions. Um, but kind of out the gate, uh, what skills do you believe, Patrice, makes a really good mentor in industry and, and why would that be? I think, um, let me get in here. I think, I think one of the skills that, that really um, makes a really great mentor is being able to lead by example. I think uh, making sure that you listen um, as, as much as you do give advice. But I think really looking at the strong points of, of where people are and sort of give advice as the way you want people to be and um, be encouraging. I think those are some of the, the pillars that um, I've always been more responsive to. And, um, and I think following up with people is is a, a key component because you don't want to uh, you want to actually close the loop to make sure that people are uh, being heard. That's that's really great. And and Andrea, I'll I'll just go right back uh, in that direction. Uh, in your opinion, uh, what makes a good mentor in industry and why? So I, for me, it's four things. Um, I think an active listener, because it definitely makes the mentee feel heard. Um, someone who's empathetic, it makes the mentee feel understood, of course. Um, definitely have to be someone with a desire to give back. Mentor, mentees feel cared for. And just being an honest and an authentic person, because it gives space for the mentee to show up authentically as uh, themselves. So those are my four things. Yeah, and Diane. I think, I think Patrice and, uh, and Andrea did a fantastic job of outlining it. I think the most important part of understanding who you are seeking after and who you find that natural connection with might not, not come right at the front, but as you're finding that natural connection and recognizing it's not a one and done thing, you're not looking for one mentor. What are you truly seeking that you can get relevant and relatable connections to? and find multiple mentors that can guide you along the way. Because we know it takes a village, but we also know you're not gonna get there by yourself. So what is the plan for you to support yourself and build your network and um, really, feel, really feel connected in that relationship? Yeah, thank you all so much for that perspective. That really helps. And uh, to go a step further in your current roles, um, and I'll just kind of go in a random order here as well. What, um, have you been able to seek out mentors in these current roles? Um, and, and what does that process look like for you? And Andrea, if you want to go first. Um. Sure, I'll hop right in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, absolutely. I am constantly seeking out mentors. And typically, I'll utilize my org chart to just identify individuals that I want to connect with to learn more about them and what it is that they do. And it's not necessarily like in the area that I'm working in. I look across the organization. Um, so I set up informational meetings, maybe 30 minutes over coffee, um, give them the opportunity to speak and share because who doesn't like talking about themselves, right? <laughs> and then by the end of our conversation, after we've shared with one another, they typically give me at least one to two names of other individuals to connect with. So it allows my network to continue to grow. Um, after the meeting is done, I get back to my desk and I always send a follow-up email just thanking them for their time. And if they respond saying, hey, I would love to do it again, I try to set up at least bi-weekly or monthly meetings, depending on what their schedule permits. So that's kind of the process that I follow. And what about you, Diane? Absolutely. I think across all the different roles I've had in the business, um, definitely have sought out mentors and very similar to Andrea, just find out who they are, find out who you're going after. It could be the org charts. I would also say it's important to know what you're looking for. Are you looking for somebody who's gonna mentor you? Meaning help guide you through, um, bounce off ideas, determine maybe they've, they've been in the role or you don't know enough about a certain area that's gonna impact you. So you go find out more about that area and they can, they can kind of mentor you on how to look at making decisions with them or partnering with them. Or are you looking for somebody to coach you through communication skills or balancing your personal world or career path? 
Or are you looking for somebody who's going to actually sponsor you? Meaning this is where you show the best of yourself forward to them. And this is somebody who you're asking to help you not only move your career, but actually voice when you're not in the room and those moves are being made. And then always, just like Andrea says, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to take the effort on the follow-up. I usually ask those mentors, coaches, or sponsors, know what you're seeking, because that's going to be really important how you approach them. But I, I ask them formally, hey, would you mind if I set up multiple meetings? Would biweekly work for you or monthly, depending on what I'm looking for, or what I need, making sure that's engagement. A good mentor, coach, or even sponsor will tell you no if they don't have enough time or if their heart's not in it or they don't think they're the right ones to, to fit, tell you that. And you have to respect that decision. It's usually not about the mentee, by the way. But a lot of times they might give you the two or three names to go reconnect with somebody else and, and look at it that way. It opens up your network, it opens up your door, and they know of your interest and your respect of why you're, you came to them in the first place. But help, let them help you navigate down that road um, so you can seek and, and seek after it and follow up on it. Yeah, and I'm glad you made that point that there are different avenues of meeting someone to help you out. Um, there's different types of mentorship there, and you've got to be clear when you're asking for that um, what you're actually looking for, because they may be looking to, to help you out in, in different avenues, and, and that may not be exactly what you were looking for as a mentee. So I'm, I'm glad you made that point. Uh, and also, Patrice, uh, what about your experiences in seeking out mentors uh, in industry? I think it's essential to make sure that you have um, uh, mentors, you know, similar to what Andrea uh, was saying is that um, I think it's really great to be in the community to either have coffee or uh, just to, to sort of pick someone else's brain about, you know, sort of, sort of the way that they see, you know, what they're doing in the next five to 10 years. Um, talk about different trends and, and different uh, ways to increase the relationship. I think that it's important to be able to, to keep your network strong and so that your, your bridges are always uh, gonna be sturdy. And mm -hmm. I think that um, you know it's important to make sure that the mentors are not just from one place. I think there needs to be a variety of different sort of a cross industry um, um, plethora of, of knowledge for those yeah. folks. And I, I appreciate everyone's uh, input so far. I do wanna pause and say uh, to everybody that's viewing with us now, please fill up our chat with any questions and comments that you have. And, and the MAP team is going to be uh, monitoring that and keeping us in the loop on those. So we. We will get to those questions uh, soon, but uh, any anything that you have, please keep us in the loop there in the chat and keep that going. Um, and then also just a little bit of my perspective too. I'm before I came to Purdue as a graduate student, uh, I, I left my undergraduate institution with a, a huge passion for um, serving people in a local community, and I I did that for three years serving as an insurance agent in in a county very near to where I lived uh, growing up, and great career, but also one of those careers that's very difficult to understand what you're supposed to do. You have a lot of things coming at you. And when you begin any type of career, you can often feel like you are drinking from a fire hose and everybody's telling you things left and right. And you just even keeping in line can be very difficult. And I remember I was lucky in, in my, my local office, there was a gentleman that had been there for almost 20 years before I started. And I just would ask him to mentor me and, and pretend that he could go back to 20 years prior. And, and what are all the crazy things when he began that he wish he hadn't have done um, and the things that he sees in me that I could be doing better. And, and I would ask him for that constantly of, you know, am I doing this right? I'd I'm meeting with customers daily and I feel lost. And it, it was so helpful to me as a mentee to hear him say, oh, you, you haven't even had your worst day yet if, if you're going based on me. Cause I was making all these stupid comments and I was running people out without even knowing what I did. And uh, that was helpful for me to see that it was 
when I was struggling, that it was okay. And then it was also nice, kind of like you said, Patrice, to not have them just from one area. I, I also had some mentors that I would seek out at conferences that were doing kind of the same thing as me, but you know, six hours away in a totally different type of community, not in a rural middle of the nowhere county, uh, but in an urban area. And you know, what what has what does that look like and what could I be doing? And, and getting those ideas bouncing off and peer mentors in that way was really helpful to me as well. And, and really in industry, when we're trying to sell products, if that's the type of thing that we're doing, if we're trying to build relationships with others, sometimes it's just good to have mentors that we're asking for feedback from, you know, what does that look like? What, am I doing this right? Do you see things that I'm doing that I should be doing differently? And, and you're not going to have to take all those and do something different. But for me, it was a lot of, you know, funneling out things that would never work for my personality and, and filtering out other things and taking everything with a grain of salt. So um, a lot of what you all had just said made me think a lot about that too. And it has helped me tremendously now, uh, years later too. Um, and so that, that jump from being working in industry and going back to academia, working on a, a career now uh, in academia and, and all that, I, I could probably sit and talk for an hour alone about the differences in mentorship in academia versus industry. And so I'm just kind of curious from your all's perspective, and, and Diane, I'll ask you first, um, what how, how has it looked different in industry from your perspective of that just mentorship as a whole versus how it might have been in academia as a student who's seeking out mentors before graduation? Yeah, I think there's a big difference and then there's some slight differences. I think that it, there are some areas where the topics might be somewhat relevant to each other, but the type of outlook you're looking for once you graduate is different than what you're doing while you're getting your degrees and finishing up your academia elements this time. Because remember, continuous learning, I don't think there's a job out there that doesn't require. So you're going to continue to evolve. And when you evolve in different frames of mind, that changes your outlook and perspective. You're looking for different skill sets. You're navigating navigating workplace dynamics, your career, your balance of how you're balancing how you want to grow as an adult or how you in an individual as a co-worker as a family member however that looks i think the most important regardless of recognizing how you continue to seek is some of the things that the team has talked about take that initiative sign that up just try it what are you spending 30 50 minutes at first it's a small investment for a lifetime of having somebody offer opinions to give you different perspectives on how you want to evolve. But the most important part is start early, start now in your academia career, um, because primarily you have to hone your skill as a mentee so that you can get the most out of your mentor mentee relationship or coach or sponsor relationships. And that takes time and you're gonna have to find the right match. And you, you'll know it when you find the right match, I have some mentors today that I still value so greatly. It's not a perfect match for me, but it's definitely giving me the perspective so that I can continue to grow as an individual and make sure that I'm, I'm thinking about a program or a problem or a career path or a job skill set in a way that I can actually continue to grow instead of being left to your own devices. The biggest thing I want you to think about mentorship is you don't have to do it on your own. If you seek out the mentors and the networks and the coaches and the sponsors, you find out that the village will carry you, but it takes your initiative and it takes your energy to follow up and keep nurturing those relationships. That's so true. Yeah. And Patrice, what, what about your experience and, and how mentoring in the workplace can be a little bit different than um, mentoring in academia? You know, some of the mentors that I was just thinking about are not, not alive. Right? I was just thinking that I have this big picture in the office of George Washington Carver. And um, one of the things that I think about, you know, is um, how long it took for him to be recognized as this wonderful, amazing scientist. And I think that's sort of a thing that sort of, sort of guides my compass, you know, in a lot of the work. 
I think, you know, from academia, you know, you're, you're not expecting, you're not expecting, at least in agriculture, the rooms <laughs> to not always be diverse. Um, I think that you sort of get used to it, but I think of it as an opportunity to be able to educate more people about the disparities that are happening within agriculture, at least in Minnesota, for sure. Um, and I think that, you know, being able to look back uh, in academia and and really make those those connections um, while you're you're um, while you're in school mode um, because you know a lot of those friendships that I made in in grad school um, I still see those same people in different rooms I might you know read something in a publication and I'm like oh I, I went to school with this person and and really just being able to, um, to keep those connections strong in academia and, and also what's happening in the industry and see where there's a common ground within the middle. And um, that's always been uh, and, and continues to be, uh, you know, really rewarding. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, Andrea, what, uh, what about your experience? With you know, I don't know that I have much more to add, <laughs> Diane completely killed that answer, um, as well as Patrice. But what I will say in my own experience in academia, I, I feel as though like advisors, um, my classmates, it was more of, I see something in you and I'm going to take you under my wing. Whereas like being in corporate America, it is, it is kind of the same thing, but like companies are huge. So you, people don't always like see you or like seek you out. And that's when it falls on you as the mentee to kind of seek out those relationships as you are like on your career trajectory, trying to figure things out. Like six years in, I'm still trying to figure things out. And so for me, it's more me seeking out um, those mentor relationships while still like reaching back and mentoring people as I climb. So I think that's the only thing that I have to add. Yeah, um, that, that's... That's a great perspective from all three of you. I, I know that we really appreciate that. And, you know, I, I guess a follow up, um, Pete in the chat had a, a really good one of, have there been any common mistakes or anything on either side of being a mentor or a mentee that you wish uh, you could go back that we could kind of learn from um, that are maybe just common pitfalls that, you know, we wouldn't know differently if we didn't have somebody kind of telling us and uh, I'll just stick with you, Andrew, and work our way backward. I will say making the assumption that um, someone wants to be a mentor. I think Diane touched on this earlier. Like, yes, you can set up these meetings and and like hit it off, have great conversations, and even have like similarities and experience, background, whatever. But it doesn't necessarily mean that this person has the capacity to be a mentor. It's something like they're interested in doing. So just not making the assumption that someone has the time or the willingness and the desire to be a mentor. Yeah. And what about you, Patrice? You know, one of the things that I have um, learned in this the, the mentor uh, realm is that not everybody um, wants you to be successful. <laughs> uh, I think that's really important to recognize that there are going to be some people that will love to see you um, stay stagnant and not uh, achieve um, uh, different dreams um, to aspire to because it's actually helping each person, but they are going to be, those are some of the common mistakes of, of being able to, to, to give too much at first, you know, over time to be able to um, to foster a, a better uh, relationship is really uh, a key thing that I learned over the over, over time. And that I'm so glad you said that because that that was a huge reminder to me as well that you know there's different careers and stuff where you might be on a trajectory where you have big goals and aspirations and dreams and you want to achieve those. So your first go-to is to find people that have been successful and ask them for things. And sometimes we don't realize that um, 
you know, some folks are just not the greatest folks. And, and if you're succeeding, then they uh, feel like they're being attacked and that they would have to then work harder themselves and you're challenging them and, and that whole process. And it would just be easier for them if you were to fail and move on than it would be to help you uh, actually reach success. And um, I, I've experienced that before, wasn't fun. Um, and I, I think that's a very important thing to remember is that when you're seeking out mentorship, sometimes you have to have your eyes wide open to the type of feedback that you're getting. And, and it is okay to sever that mentorship relationship um, in those regards. And, and there's nothing saying that you have to stay as a mentee, um, even if you're just scared that you don't have somebody else to take that mentor spot and you might have to be without a mentor for a little bit. Um, it's so much better to have somebody that believes in you and fuels you than have somebody that's just constantly going to find ways to not have you being your best. And I think that's a huge thing to remember. So I'm glad you said that. Uh, Diane, from your experience, um, what, uh, what are some of those kind of challenges that we have experienced that we don't always think of? I think the, I have a couple, I have quite a few actually, but uh, I would say probably the most important one is is staying with a mentor because I thought that I had to have a lifetime commitment with them. So I'm glad that you both had brought up that sometimes that relationship's exhausted or sometimes it it's it the relevancy's not there. Um, so you have to you have to close it out. And there's great ways to close it out, you know, a note, a small gift, uh, whatever it might be that tells them what you're appreciating them for and the time and the effort when they were completely relevant and, and capable to be your mentor. The other thing, um, one of the biggest mistakes is that every advice from the mentor I got was going to result in something greatness. And that's not true, whether they intended good intentions, I'm gonna assume, assume good intentions, but it's not, it's gotta, it, the relationship the ability, that is one piece of advice. And what that's, I'm a big believer that you need more than one mentor for the reason, because you want to have different perspectives. You want to have that advice. You want to be able to blaze your own trail. Um, and so I think that's, that's important to note that you're seeking advice, but that's, that's as far as it goes. How you translate that and, and push your results is really there guidance for you on how they and their perspective would do it. But you have to frame up your own mind with that. And then I'd say the biggest mistake I've made across my career journey is I thought it was more important that I could show my boss or I could show my near manager or my peer said that I could handle it and I could take care of it and I could do it this way. But what happened is you move forward, but nobody else moved with you. And then when you're not in those rooms where the conversations are happening about your career, your, your, where you're going next, how you should be reshaped, the feedback comes in a weird spot, how to handle that, that is where the mentors, the coaches, the right approach can go forward. And so I think it's important for you to recognize having the multiples for the variety of perspective, having your, having the, the knowledge and know-how that man, life is better with a network and it's better with moving forward. Um, and that's why I'm so passionate about mentoring and coaching and sponsorship. Um, and then I'd tell you my last and fourth error is I thought mentors were only either older, wiser, or higher level than me in some case. And that's a misnomer. I have junior members across the organization that I work in today that mentor me with how things actually work. And if I provide a piece of communication, how will that be perceived? I can't think of better mentors than making sure that you have a rounded out plan of how you're going across it. And so making sure that you're rounding out across levels, across sex, across um, different backgrounds across diversity, because if you keep picking people that look like you, act like you, um, or are only one type of person, you're going to 
you're not going to get that differentiation that's really going to allow you to blaze your trail in the best way possible. And so the, I've learned that along the way. I'm hoping that you can not go through some of the pitfalls I did, but I also feel like I, it's part of me and it charged me up and it's made me who I am as I go through my world. Yeah, such good perspective there. All three of you just, it, it's, it's, it reminded me of in, in my experience um, in industry, feeling like I am less than and should I just change everything? I don't know. I, I feel like I'm being mentored and it's tough and I want to be better and I'm, I'm not seeing immediate results in everything. And I had a really good mentor uh, about six years ago and uh, really appreciated his perspective. Um, and he just brought me aside. He said, Stephen, if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you'll rot. And he's like, I, and it's okay to be green right now because you are figuring it all out and that's fine. I would rather see you on that trajectory of you're trying and you're making improvements uh, than to have you thinking that you've already got everything figured out and I, I wouldn't want to see that. And that has always helped me that if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you'll rot. Um, and Diane, you said something really good there at the end. And that, that kind of brings me into our next type of question. So the mentoring at Purdue program that uh, we've had for about 10 years now uh, at the university has really been in place to help minorities and women um, in the United States navigate mentoring relationships in their future careers, specifically in STEM careers um, and, and within agriculture, food, and natural resources as well. But because that's really what this program has been founded upon, it, it brings this question of in academia, students are always challenged to find and identify diverse mentors. So how would you suggest that they navigate um, and, and find mentors. You, you mentioned having mentors there, Diane, of folks from all different backgrounds and, and a lot of different opinions that could help. Um, but how would you suggest to our students that they do that? that? That can be difficult if you just don't know where to start. So I'll start with you. Okay. Um, I think what's important, and in my history, when I first started out in the industry, all of my mentors were women. And that's going to give you one perspective or different perspectives, but all from the same frame of mind. And so as you're starting to seek out, sometimes you wanna talk about certain uncomfortable places with your mentor, but as it's not the first question that comes out of your mind, it's after you've gotten a relationship built up with that mentor, and then you can go deeper into the conversation. But you're also looking for somebody who's completely willing to allow you to be vulnerable if they're a mentor or if they're a coach so that they can bring you along with them. And so as I, as I look for that, when I started to screen out different experiences, I did look at the org charts. I did look at the leaders that I saw coming in. And then I also map my mentors. So when you start feeling like something's not going right and you don't know why you can't get over that hill, that's usually a good time for a coach or a mentor. It's usually time that you should seek out advice, seek out ways that you can broaden your thinking to get around the, the hurdle that's in front of you or actually create skills with you. So seeking out, I think Andrea had brought it up at the beginning, looking at those org charts, looking around you, actually asking managers or asking your professors, who else can I talk to about this? And then you start to build into those different vulnerabilities that usually linked down to the common of communication, skill set, approach, mannerisms of how you might be able to get, to get forward in your, in your job and what you're trying to do today, even in school. So I think it's, but taking that initiative is the hardest step and you find out it's a lot easier than you think. You just put yourself out there. Again, you're only spending 20, 30 cup of coffee, you know, have a, have a Pepsi in the afternoon, whatever it might be that allows you to start to build that relationship with somebody. And then if it works, it works. If it doesn't, don't stop. Don't get discouraged. Keep going. I like that. Uh, that little plug that you had there, Diane, very, very wise. <laughs> Everybody get a Pepsi. Um, what about you, Andrea? What, uh, how would you suggest that our, our viewers for this event um, would navigate identifying and, and, building relationships with a diverse group of mentors. 
So I will say as an extrovert, um, it's not hard for me to go to an org chart and like set up a meeting, but we have to be inclusive and consider those who are introverts who may not feel comfortable. So one place to start, I know there are several companies, um, their HR departments have like formal mentorship programs. So it's like, you're not sure what to do, go to HR, let them know you're looking for a mentor, they may be able to prepare you. Um, when I first arrived, Land Lake, moved to Minnesota, I'm a Mississippi girl. So from down south, got to Minnesota, no family, nothing. Um, and I needed to find like that sense of community for me. So I actually connected with the employee resource group at my company, our African Ancestry um, Employee Resource Group, but others. So our Women's Leadership Network. Um, I connected with our Young Professionals Network. So just different groups. And you'll find that, um, and I think Diane touched on this earlier, it's not just about mentors who at, are at higher levels than you. It's your peer mentors. It, it's uh, those mentors that are in lower level positions that you are. And so just connecting with those groups uh, within um, my company has allowed me to build relationships and uh, find diverse mentors at all levels. And what about you, Patrice? I think many times when you're thinking about those relationships, um, with the mentors, um, those those relationships actually can come from a lot of different ways. The you know when you're working with your uh, your staff, you know you want to make sure that um, that there's a example that they can follow. I know one example that, um, that I was just thinking about when Andrea was talking was that when I first started this position. I get on the elevator and someone says, what floor I'm going to? I said the fifth floor. And then someone said, oh, you're going to the principal's office. <clears throat> and I said, oh, that, that sounds pretty sad. <laughs> but then I had to think about, you know, what mentor uh, has this particular employee been um, talking, you know, talking to and what's been preventing her uh, from actually being able to have someone speak into her life in a positive way. And so um, I really started to, to say, no, we're not gonna have any separation between that floor or any other floor and start to have this welcoming, um, you know, you can come in any time type of atmosphere so that people didn't feel that they were, uh, that they couldn't talk to other people if they needed to have mentorship and inviting different ideas um, is really sort of a key component to, um, you know, to making things happen. And I know in the chat, it says that mentors do not have to be only senior individuals. Uh, that is so true. A mentor could be your um, executive aid staff. It could be it could be uh, someone who's in the maintenance level. It could be anybody that you come across that has a bit of wisdom that allows you to think and pause and then move forward. So I think um, that's a great point to, to kind of level the playing field of, um, of uh, mentors and mentorship. Yeah, that, a great perspective from each of you. Thank you for that. Um, and then on, on kind of that same type of avenue of knowing what to do and, and how to do that, we had one question of what strategies are the most appropriate, would you think, for mentees that have a workplace conflict? Um, what should their next steps be as a mentee um, in trying to figure out what, what to do? Um, and Patrice, if you want to start out with that one, we'll go back, back through everybody else. That's a great question. Um, I think the first thing is to let the let the uh, the mentor know that you have this conflict and see if there's something that can be worked out in order to still continue that mentee mentor relationship. Sometimes that if you have a conflict, maybe that that relationship might have to be altered in a way that allows you to. Um, to do it in a unique fashion. Maybe it's doing um, the way that we're talking right now, um, uh, doing it that way. But I think, you know, definitely communication is a, a essential component to making sure that that, um, 
that if you have a conflict, you have to let people know up front. Yeah. Um, and what about you, Diane? I think when I look across, if a mentee comes to me with a problem that's happened in the office, there's a couple things that go through my mind in coaching them how to best handle it. And I have to understand, is this something that they can, like Patrice had mentioned, can you continue to work in that environment? Is it something even more serious than that? Is it something less serious? So there's numerous approaches that if they're coming to me, are they going to their own manager? Or are they having a direct resolution with the person they have a conflict with? Communication, like Patrice had answered, is immediately like figure out what the situation, there's two sides to every story. So it's making sure that they have the empathy to see where's the conflict coming from. And maybe it's a simple communication. If it's something else in the environment um, that doesn't allow them to go to their manager or go to the direct employee or something of that likeness, then there's a lot of different channels they can use. They can pull in HR as a mentor, you can pull in HR and have that conversation with the mentee in a safe space. If it's we at, at the company I'm in, we have a speak up line. And some of them, they fall into different investigative procedures to understand what's the true story here and what's the, what's with the, um, there's code of conduct violations. And then there's, you know, simple, we don't get along in our project team. And so that's a very complicated place for, for, an employee to be in. And so I think from that perspective, there's a lot of different avenues, but making sure that they recognize that that truth and candor and that bringing it to the forefront and not sweeping it under the rug, making sure that that communication is strong because you should always be looking at how to get to a better place and not just stay, stay the path because that's not working for anybody. And often employees leave. So as a senior director in the company, I am heartbroken by that because we look at those individuals as developmental professionals. I, I'm on a path for them to replace me. So they're going to leave the company over something that I might have been able to get involved in and hopefully set, solve for them. So that would be my recommended advice. Like, let's look at what we're really talking about and the best ways to approach it and then escalate it appropriately so that we can re get to a resolution very quickly. Andrea. Um, I just add to never avoid or ignore conflict. Um, my rule of thumb is just practicing the 24 hour rule before addressing something um, so that I can just fully really think through how to best handle it. I oftentimes will reach out to a mentor to be a sounding board and have them coach me through the conversation and actually practice having the conversation mm -hmm. uh, with my mentor. Um, and then once like the issue has been identified, I reach out to the individual that I had the conflict with, and then I try to have us identify a solution together. That, that's really great perspective on these. And, you know, we, we don't like conflict. Um, and it, it's just nice to know that if we have a game plan, if anything ever happens to know what those next steps are. So thank you for your perspective on that. That's, um, that'll help if, if and when we, we have to deal with those unfortunate conversations that have to happen. Um, and I want to be respectful of, of time and make sure that we have um, enough opportunity for everybody else to ask some questions. So I want to open up. Um, if there's anything that I've missed in the chat, please let me know. Otherwise, we have a, a few minutes to unmute yourself if you're a participant and you want to ask our panelists some, uh, any types of questions from their perspective, please feel free to do so now. Greetings, I have a question for the panel, if you don't mind, Stephen. Um, thanks yeah. for um, facilitating this panel um, discussion, has been great. Um, so for anybody on the panel, my question is, um, how can we identify who should stand as a sponsor for us and who was fit to be a mentor in industry and what factors matter the most when choose either one of those? Thank you. Whoever wants to jump on that first, feel free. I'll take a stab at it. Um, the, the sponsor definition, um, which is relatively evolving rather new in the last 10 years. Um, in the sponsor definition, 
you are looking for somebody who's a mover and shaker within your career reporting line. And so you are looking for somebody who's definitely a senior person. It's not your manager. It is definitely above your manager or peer set of the person who's the one up or beyond from your manager. So you're looking at those higher levels. And when you're looking for them, that's somebody who's in, in, in response to your project work so that they're actually seeing the greatness that you bring to the role and that they would continue to advocate for you. They might give you advice like a mentor would, but they're not looking for your vulnerability to be sharing or your, your messy bouncing off ideas. They're not looking for that. <laughs> they're just looking to help promote great talent across the company. That's your sponsor. You show the best to them. Your mentor or a coach, depending on how you approach that, because coaching is like sideline coaching. They're walking along with you. This might be a technical peer set. This might be somebody who's um, uh, either somebody who's a direct report, even it could be your manager, whatever that might be. And then your mentor, somebody who, in my mind, is somebody who's kind of removed from your work stream so that you can get a broader view of bouncing off. But I've had mentors that are on my project work team that I would still bounce off ideas and then we still drive the agenda. And I've had coaches that haven't been part. So that one's a little bit more fuzzier. But when I'm looking for them, that is the folks that I can get vulnerable with. That's truth, transparency, the reality, get down to the bones of it and be a direct communication. So that's when you're seeking them out, make sure you're seeking, you know what you're seeking. A lot of times after a mentor might've seen all of it, they can raise to be the level of a sponsor. But often if they're only a sponsor, they can't, they can't handle when they see bumps in your road. So that's that's just something to watch out as you're navigating that area. And again, it's always, it's wonderful when you have a sponsor, it's hard when you do not. And it's harder when you pick the wrong one that might not have your best interest in mind. So as you continue to navigate that, continue to evaluate it. I assume good intentions, but again, if the intentions aren't, aren't where you want them to go, then don't be afraid to thank them for their service and kindness and commitment and, and go to the next one. Yeah. Uh, our other panelists, do you have anything to add on that as well? The only thing that I'll add is in my experience, as it relates to sponsors, um, you typically do not seek out sponsors. They choose you because they're the ones who have a seat at the table. They're the ones who are advocating for you behind the scenes as it relates to your career. And that's just in my experience because you can identify someone like this person could possibly be a, a great mentor for me. And to Diane's point, like that person may grow into a sponsor who is also advocating for you at levels above you. And they're championing, championing, can't say that word, championing you to others. So um, that's just my experience. I have not sought out sponsors. They have typically sought me out based on my work um, within my company, how I have like su succeeded with like projects and, and just different things like how I'm performing. So just my experience. Anything else to add there? All right, um, and I don't know if I've missed anything else in the chat, but uh, if anybody else wants to ask a question uh, to our panelists as well, of any other topics. I just had a general question about you know, how do you know how often you should reach out to a mentor? Is it just kind of like as a as need basis? Or, I mean, maybe it just depends, but I was just curious to get your thoughts on that. Anybody want to jump in on that one first? I can share. I, on sponsors or on mentors, I, on mentors, if I'm building the relationship, I have regular frequent connects that are agreed between the two of us. And I change those like, hey, is this timing still working for you? But what you want in a mentor is somebody who's gonna be a little bit along the journey with you 
so that when you come to them with a situation outside of your timing, so let's say you connect with a mentor biweekly, you realize you're going to move to a monthly situation or even a bi-monthly situation, then you get into a situation where you actually need their advice and you can call them up and pick up the phone. And you want you don't want the, to wait till the next month. You want to have an you want to have that interaction connection and they will make time for you on the calendar to make sure you can get into that. So I feel it, it depends on how often, but it's it's how frequent that they will you negotiate the time. And sometimes I've had a couple connects with a mentor before I've actually scheduled regular connects with them, just to make sure that we're both vested in the situation that I'm trying to approach them with. Grace, Andrea, anything to add there? No, no. that's perfect. Anybody else uh, have any other any other questions or things that they would like to pose to our panelists? Well, once again, this has been a really great topic. And as I mentioned at the beginning, our, our listeners have consistently been asking for something like this. And, and we're glad we were able to put this together and that uh, you all were willing to serve as panelists this go round. This has been amazing to hear your perspective on everything. Um, one thing I do want to say as we, as we close out, um, I want to guide everybody's attention to the chat. Um, we do have in there um, a, a link to a Qualtrics survey of how we can improve these in the future. And another area of different topics and things that you would like to see as we plan ahead uh, for the MAP program. So please fill that out if you have a chance to do that. Um, and then before I ended anything, uh, I wanted to kind of do a, an opportunity for a plug for our Purdue Ag alumni and that connection. I know that that's always a great way for our students, especially those at Purdue, um, to connect with, with people that have kind of been in their shoes before and can kind of navigate that. So um, for a couple of seconds, uh, if Danica or Brandy or anybody else wants to share anything to our viewers, please do so. Otherwise, um, look out for some of those uh, resources as well. So did, did anybody want to share anything or any any plugs for that as well? You didn't tell me I was going to be on camera, Steve. I'm sorry. I just wanted oh to Oh my shout gosh. Out. No, I had to hide in my room right now because somebody's watching <laughs> TV in the other room. Um, no, uh, thank you so much for the plug. I'm so proud to have two of our board members here on the panel today. Looking forward to including more of you as time goes on. Um, the Ag Alumni Association is a non fee uh, association. Once you graduate with a degree from Purdue Ag, you are part of our group. Um, we have a board that meets four times a year. We developed a strategic plan in 2020 um, and have been working towards that for the last few years. And some of those things include um, supporting our um, young alumni. Um, also, um, we do have several board members that are very committed to supporting students um, from diverse backgrounds and things like that. So we have a lot of our board members who um, that's their passion and are supporting our current graduate and undergraduate students in that way. Um, we also are uh, exploring international travel opportunities as alumni groups. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, looking forward to that. And just um, really glad to, to have the support of the college and of our great board members this is the perfect thing for them to be doing. Uh, we do have a mentoring program. Brandy Farr is on the call now and she manages that. And so if you are interested in being matched with an alum, uh, we have a lot more alumni than we do students that are, we have a lot more alumni wanting to mentor students than we have students who want to be mentored. So help us fill that gap because we have a lot of people who wanna help uh, our students out. Um, but if you just want to email brandy at purdue.edu um, or go to the Ag Alumni website and fill out um, the mentee form, we would be glad to get you connected to, to some alums. So thank you so much. No, yeah. thank you. And the, only sorry, follow -up I would there, say, the only follow up I would say about our Ag Alumni Mentor Program is their semester long commitment. So um, people know right away what their commitment is so that they don't have to get 
bogged down and alumni that are on the list, if it's going to be a, a busy semester for you with your workload or professional career or home life, um, you would just say, please don't match me this semester, but we'll keep you on the list. So we try to keep uh, alumni engaged in what works for them. Right. That's wonderful. So to all of our participants, please um, reach out. I know that it has been difficult for me in the past sometimes to know what to do when seeking a mentor, and that's a great place to start, especially those that are in Purdue uh, seeking an agricultural degree as well. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you to our panelists. This has been amazing to hear your perspective. I really appreciate you taking the time to share with our audience. This was great, and it was exactly what we were needing to know. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and I really appreciate everyone who was able to take some time out of their day and attend. If uh, you know anybody that would like to watch this or um, if you wanna come back and visit some of these uh, comments that were shared, this has been recorded and uh, pretty shortly, it'll be available on our YouTube channel and our, our website as well. So be on the lookout for that. It's also on our, uh, our Facebook page too. So if you have anybody that you would like to direct to this as a resource, go ahead and do that as well. And then again, just take a couple minutes, if you don't mind, to fill out that Qualtrics survey and help us to make these even better in the future. That would be a whole lot of help. Um, but just on behalf of all of us on the MAP team, thank you so much, and I hope you have a really great rest of your day. Thank you.